All right, we are going live. I'll give it a moment for people to jump on board before I get started. And so, like I said, I'll just hang out, wait for a few people. If you're watching this on the replay, I always say fast forward to about five minutes so you don't have to wait around for people to jump on board. So uh, today's topic is going to be habits. So um, as always, I think you'll find it very interesting. Again, just give it a moment for people to jump on board. So if you got to go get a little beverage, some coffee, whatever it may be, now's the time. Paco LeBron, my man. Man, it's been a long time, my friend. Paco, it has been a long time, man. All right, man. So glad you found me on Facebook, man. So looking forward to it, man. Let me see if I can drag your comment over, Paco. I'm testing something out here. Boom, there's Paco LeBron. Out of Chicago, man. Hopefully uh, they're opening things up in Chicago a little bit, Paco. So it's not too bad. So again, we'll just wait a little bit. Chill, get some coffee. I actually have some hot water. Dean Hanky. Hey, man. You know, Dean, I don't, have we ever met face-to-face, -face, Dean? I don't think we've ever met face-to-face. -face. I think we've just exchanged, what, messages, videos, and pictures on, on Facebook. So look forward to meeting you one day, baby. Maybe even sharing the stage with you. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be awesome. So we're here in Georgia, man. Things are starting to loosen up a little bit. And so uh, this morning I went out and got some coffee. It was a little more traffic than usual. Went over to Starbucks, the drive-thru. Um, but still, more traffic coming on board, so we'll see how that goes. And so I'm really happy. I think everything's starting to return. I don't like to say normal. And I'm not going to use the phrase new normal either. I'm just saying, things are starting to at least move in the right direction. Leonidas, 300. How many times do you hear that, Leonidas, with your name, right? Leonidas Alexandro. You hear that probably a lot, my friend. So, but yeah, so um, I've been working on the studio. If you can see what's going on in the studio, got the new board, uh, working on some lightings, got some new microphones, got some other lighting over here. Uh, let me see, got some speakers down there. You can't see them. Got some new interfaces down there. So like I said, trying to get my virtual game in line. So like I said, I'll wait another minute. So then I'll just launch into this thing. So um, let me see, what else is new? So I got to publish my book. It's already done. It's called uh, Upselling is the New Prospecting. Upselling is the New Prospecting. So it's just a matter of me pulling the trigger and publishing the book. So we'll see what happens. So yeah, Dean, man, for sure, man, for sure. All right, well, I'm going to get started. Um, uh, the topic of this uh, live stream is the power of habits. I don't know if you read the book by Charles Duhigg. Uh, he wrote The Power of Habits uh, a few years back, and then recently, by recently I mean about a year and a half ago, uh, I forgot, James Clear wrote the book Atomic Habits, which really piggybacks off of, you know, the, the Charles Duhigg stuff, which I thought was, it's kind of a nice little dovetail and adds another layer, so to speak. But this morning I was talking to a customer, uh, I'm doing my coaching sessions with them, um, and so when I was coaching them, uh, you know, I realized that, you know, the, the person had bad habits and bad habits could be physical bad habits, but they also be mental bad habits. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So what's going on? Uh, thank you, man. Thank you, man. Working hard, working hard. Uh, so let's look at the power, like I said, the power of habits. Let me just start there. And one of the things that I love about this model that Charles Duhigg had in his book is that it has allowed me as a sales trainer to actually explain to salespeople, you know, where they're at in the learning process. Allow me to go into the model first, and then we're going to talk about it. And then I'm going to show how it applies to your world, your life, your daily daily, right? And so what they did was they had, like they, they had set up an experiment. I'm going to give you the short version of this. They set up an experiment where they set up a maze, right? That's a maze, right? It's a tea maze. There's a little gate here, right? And they put a little mouse here. That's a mouse. Right? And over here, they put a piece of chocolate. Now, what they've done is they, they put, I don't know, electrodes in the, brain, in the mouse's head. How? I have no idea. But they're monitoring, like an EKG machine, EKG machine, they're monitoring the, um, the electrical activity, right? And so what happens is there would be a click sound. The mouse would hear a click sound, click, the gate would swing open, and then the mouse would go in, sniff, sniff, sniff for a while and just kind of explore the maze and maybe not find the chocolate, but after a time, they took the mouse out, closed the gate, and then again, did the same thing. Click, 
Mouse goes in, gate opens, mouse goes in, sniff, 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 maybe it goes in further, take the mouse out again, get the idea. They repeat this so many times to eventually, after so many times, the mouse realizes that all it has to do is once it hears the click, the gate's gonna open, it knows this. What it's gonna do then, it's gonna go walk straight this way and left. In other words, after let's say 100 times, I'm just picking 100 as a random number, after 100 times, it knows what to do. I hear the click, gate opens, I walk down the maze, turn left, there's my chocolate, right? And what they, when they, what's interesting about this study is that they were looking at the electrical activity in the actual mouse's brain. Now bear with me, in case you're wondering where I'm going with them, trust me, this applies to you, just wait, just wait, just wait. So what they found, let's say at time, the first time you put the, the mouse in or the second time, doesn't matter. What happened was, if this is electrical activity over time here, what you saw was a, a spike in electrical energy, a lot of rumbling up here, and then when it found the actual chocolate, there's another peak there, and then pure satiation, they relax, right? Satiated, right? Now, this is, let's say, a time one or two at the beginning, right? Now, after the hundredth time, something different happened. I'm gonna use a different color for this. Hopefully, it'll pop out at you. So, what they found out is that after a hundred times, the activity was like this. Click, gate opens, immediately you see the same spike, right? Same spike. But then, all of a sudden, the electroactivity dropped down to here, down to here, and then it spiked when it found the chocolate, and there it is, two different patterns. Now, what's going on here? Because this is, this is really fascinating, well, at least to me it is. It's fascinating because Originally, the first time the mouse was put in the actual maze, what happened was it spiked a lot of rumbling, right? Because the mouse was thinking. It was sniffing and thinking, sniffing and thinking, and it found the chocolate eventually. When it did, calm down, right? After a hundred times, again, spiked, but this time it actually dropped. The electrical activity dropped. Why? Because it simply became a habit. Because it became a habit, the mouse didn't have to think about it that much. In other words, it up here was thinking because it didn't know. Then when it got used to doing it, it didn't have to think so much in order to get the reward. You ever, if for those of you who ever did stick shift, right? If you ever driven a manual car, do you remember when you first started driving the car? You're like, okay, okay, let me see if I get this right. Okay, okay, clutch in, right? Put it in first, accelerate just a little bit, you know, go for it type of thing, right? And release the clutch slowly, right? And initially when you started learning how to drive this car, it's all, it was all hiccuping, right? Back and forth, just all hiccup. So what's interesting is that after, let's say, a hundred times doing it, you didn't have to think about it. You'd like put in first gear, clutch in, clutch out, and you, and you drove away. It's the same thing. After a while, you didn't have to think about it. Now, why is this important? It's important for many reasons. Because if you think about it, because all this right here, and I want to use a different color for this, because this is important. Because no, you no longer have to think about it, your electrical activity drops down, which means all this right here, this shaded part right here, if I can just shade this, this shaded part right there, that's like extra processing power that you now have because your brain is not dedicated to just what? Trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out, trying to know what to say, trying to figure it out, trying to understand. It already knows because it knows and it's become a habit, you're rumbling down here. So that all of a sudden, all this right here becomes like additional processing power. Now this answers the question as to why when people have the experience, they become better at communicating with their customers. Why? Because they have all this extra processing power. When you're first starting out at sales, you're all the way up here. You're thinking about what to say, how to say it, when to say it, how to respond. You're self-conscious. You're really thinking about things. But when you become an expert, you don't have to process so hard. So all this extra processing power allows you to be in the conversation with your clients. I mean, really engaged with your clients. So that's the first thing I wanted to share with you, that this is why practice makes perfect. When you're doing a presentation, you don't wanna be up here having to think about what you have to say. You wanna be down here where you don't have to think about what you say, and then this extra processing power you can use to read body language, read verbal cues, right, or, or visual cues, mi micro expressions rather, right? So this is what the best presenters do. Because they're so good at what they do, they're down here because they don't have to think about their presentation, what they have to say. And they use this capacity right here, this extra processing power to read the audience. Understand again, small subtle clues that most people would miss. Now, and again, this is important because when you're talking to a customer, what you don't want to do is have to think all the time about what you have to say. That's when the conversation becomes clunky 
But when you know what you have to say already, again, use the extra capacity to have that dynamic conversation. This is also why role playing is important. Yes, role playing. I know, I know, I know. Nobody likes role playing. I don't like role playing. It's uncomfortable. But when you role play, what you're doing is you're moving from up here to down here. By role playing, practicing with somebody else, what you have to say, by the way, let me define role playing, two people practicing a script, you know, call and response, speak and response, speak and response, like you're talking to a client. And what happens is that because you're practicing so much that when you actually have to do it in front of a customer, boom, it becomes really natural, right? It becomes so good and so fluid that you sound like you're confident. See, if you have to think about what you say, customers can sense that. You ever have somebody just hesitate on what, when they're gonna say something like, and you go, I don't think that person knows what they're talking about because they're hesitating. They sound hesitant. But when you're confident and you know what to say, it's a whole different conversation. And this makes all the difference in the world when it comes to selling. Sometimes you know your product. Sometimes you know you have a great product. It's a great price also. You have quality, you have the service, but your ability to deliver the message is what matters. And this is what's gonna allow you to do that. So that's the first thing. Program your brain so that your presentation becomes habitual. I'll tell you a true story on how to know your content and why you should know your content at all times. So about a year and a half ago, I, I was in uh, Nashville and I was doing a workshop for a very large company, just a workshop. And so there was a keynote speaker that was gonna be on at eight in the morning. And then I was gonna do a workshop at 10 o'clock and then at 1 p.m. So I had two workshops, right? So that night I decided to go to bed early, get some sleep. And about 2.30 in the morning, I get a call. I get a call, says, hey, uh, we lost our keynote speaker. That's another story. He says, we were wondering, Victor, and I'm half asleep while I'm answering this phone. I mean, literally half asleep. And they said, you know, would you be open to doing the, the opening keynote? And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, I'm half asleep. I go, yeah, sure. And no sooner than I hung up the phone, I hung up the phone, I remember looking at my wife. I said, did I just agree to a keynote? And she just says, ah, you agreed to something. And I agreed to the keynote. So I remember I had to be down there like at seven o'clock. But again, because I knew my material, I was able to deliver an exceptional keynote. And I didn't find out till later that they had called. This is the embarrassing part. I thought I was their first call, right? The go-to man, right? No, I was like their third or fourth call. So they were going down and every other speaker they called before me refused to do the actual speech. They were too nervous or didn't know the material. But when you know your material well enough, being called at 2.30 in the morning to do a presentation the very next morning, like in five and a half hours, you can do it. So know your material. So that's the far first part of what was in Charles Dewey's book, The Power Habit. Now, this second part, I think, is what I want you to start thinking about because I find this part fascinating. So let's tie them together. Now, we get the whole habit thing, right? You hear, you hear a click, bam, and then what happens? So let's describe it. Charles Duick says what happened to the mouse was the mouse heard a cue. The cue was the click. Click, right? The gate's open. Then the mouse knew that all it had to do was enter the maze, right? Go straight, turn left, and then there was a, the last part he calls it the reward, right? Right? And this reward is what creates this craving, he calls it, that keeps the cycle going. So every time the mouse heard a click, he knew that the routine was walk down, go left, and the reward was a piece of chocolate, right? That's how a habit is formed. Now, bear with me, now I'm gonna tie it back to you. In the morning when you go to the office, or in this case, when you go to your home office, right? What happens? You see your computer, right? It's like, bam, you see the computer. And all of a sudden, that's a cue, right? Much like the click, that's a cue. And what's usually the routine? Most of us, when we see our computer, the first thing we're gonna do, if we're in business mode, is check our email. Right, that's the routine. See the computer, that's the cue. The routine, check the email, right? Now what's the reward? We know what the reward is. You ever have like 100 emails or you know just a long list of emails and what's the first thing you start doing? Delete, 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 delete. Come on, man, if you're with me, just hit me with a one. Just hit me with a one on the comment. Just hit me with a one because that's what we typically do, right? We go delete, 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 delete. And then boom, we feel good. Oh, I got it down to 25 and that's your reward. So think about all these things. When you see something, 
you begin to do something. You ever, if you're a smoker, if you see somebody smoking, guess what you want to do? The cue is you saw somebody or maybe even smelled it. That's the cue. Your routine is to go outside and have a cigarette. The reward is what? The nicotine hit that you're going to get. So these are routines that we get into all the time. Now, if you're a manager, I want you to pay attention to this part because I think this relates to you. If you're a manager, this is a routine that people get into, right? Now, do you have an employee? I'm talking to managers now. Do you have an employee that it's like that one person that just doesn't seem to get it? They're always coming to you when they have a problem. And you're like, this person simply doesn't learn. They don't get it. Whose fault do you think that is? Yours. Here's why. Now let me explain it to you what, what's going on here. Why the person keeps coming back to your office. Because here's Johnny, right? Johnny has a problem. That's usually a cue. Oh, he gets stuck. Oh, I don't know how to do this. Oh, I forgot how to do this. What's, the, what's Johnny's routine? To go to where? Your office. So Johnny knows that all he has to do is go to your office and you'll be right there. And what's the reward? What do you give him for a reward? You give him the answers. You give them the answers, which is why they keep coming back because you're giving them the answers. And if somebody was looking from above, analyzing what's going on, if you look at, let's say, asking questions, listening, or talking, right? If you looked at the ratios right here, you know, you probably spend maybe 10% of your time asking Johnny questions. You probably spend maybe 30% actually listening to what Johnny has to say, but you probably spend like, I'll say 60% talking. Talking is giving them the answers. Now, that's why they keep coming back because every time they have a problem, they go to your office, that's the routine, and when they get there, you give them the answer. But what if you wanna make people independent? Let's reverse this now. What if you can just reverse these two numbers? What if, instead of talking 60%, you reverse that by asking 60% of the time that you're in there, you're asking questions and you're only talking about 10% of the time. In other words, giving content. What do you think will happen? If the majority of time Johnny walks into your office, instead of giving them the answer, or in this case, giving him the answer, what would you do? If you just asked him questions, what would happen if you just asked him questions? You might be surprised to find out that Johnny now has to think about it. Johnny has to think about it and really think about it very hard. And eventually, maybe he'll come to its own conclusion and figure it out for himself. But you're teaching Johnny, one, how to be a critical thinker. But you're also thinking, uh, teaching Johnny how, in the future, if Johnny has a problem, instead of just running to your office, somewhere between here and your office, he's probably gonna stop. I said, wait a minute. Every time I go see Victor, he's just gonna ask me 100 questions. And so why don't I just ask myself 100 questions? And all of a sudden, you're training Johnny not to come to your office, but to ask himself questions. So the routine has now been replaced with not going to your office, but the routine was every time he has a problem, he now says, let me ask myself questions or walk through it mentally. That's the second benefit. The third benefit of all this is that if Johnny figures it out for himself, Johnny has these aha moments that he came up with. And because there were his, his aha moments, guess what happens? His self-esteem rises, his level of confidence rises, and you have a better employee. So keep this in mind that this is actually what's happening sometimes when your salespeople come to you and you give them the answer instead of giving them answers. Ask them questions, really drill down and make them think. And then all of a sudden, instead of going to your office to whine about what they can't do, right? They're gonna start, the new routine is gonna be asking themselves questions. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. That's in my um, book, Sales Models. Uh, I released this about two years ago. I think this is one of my better books. I'm not trying to sell you on this book, by the way, but what's interesting about this book, it has 50 different models for selling. My brain thinks in models. All right, I got models in my head because that's how I remember things. This is a model and the one I showed you before, that's a model. And so I have all these visuals in my head because I'm very visually oriented. I don't know if you're with me on that, but that's the only way I can really kind of capture uh, you know, content. So I'm gonna start wrapping this up. I've been 20 minutes almost. Uh, by the way, any questions? I'll hang out for a couple of questions. If not, I am out of here. Just wanted to jump on real quick and just share some content with you. Uh, Dean, again, thanks for hanging out. Uh, Dean, the Pavlovian response, right? Ding, salivate. Very closely related, right? Same thing. Uh, Paco, thank you. Rajev, Patki, thank you for joining me. Uh, if there's no questions, I'm going to head out of this place. And again, hope you're enjoying your day. And as they say, selling ain't hard when you know how. Who says that? 
Yeah, I say it. Talk to you later, man. See you. Bye.